Ladies and gentlemen, this is DVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and oh, welcome aboard the Eastern Express. Just hours after a meeting between Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev, Raisi tragically died in a helicopter crash. Now, let's rewind to the fateful meeting on the Iranian-Azerbaijani border. Near the end of their discussions, President Aliyev praised the strength of their bilateral relationship. From these statements, you would think that the two nations have no history of animosity and Iran-Azerbaijan unity and friendship is unshakable. But that's not the case. Let's take a look at the recent history of the bilateral relationship between Tehran and Baku. Iran and Azerbaijan, two countries whose relations have been strained for a long time, are currently working on a transit corridor and are considering normalizing relations. These efforts follow Baku's rapid offensive to recover Nagorno-Karabakh and the subsequent exodus of ethnic Armenians from the region. Iran officially welcomed the return of the region to the jurisdiction of Azerbaijan. In addition, the Iranian authorities informed that the Azerbaijani embassy in Tehran may soon resume work. Azerbaijan evacuated its embassy in Tehran after a January shooting in which one staff member was killed and two were injured. The January attack on the embassy and the shooting in March of an Azerbaijani MP known for his vocal criticism of Iran are notable causes of recent tensions, but disagreements between Iran and Azerbaijan have deeper roots. Azerbaijan has long accused Iran of favoring Armenia in the decades-long Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, especially after the 2020 war, when Azerbaijan took control of its entire border with Iran. Azerbaijan accused Iran of sending oil and other goods and even weapons to the separatist authorities in Karabakh. For its part, Tehran feared that the proposed Zangiza corridor connecting Azerbaijan with its Nakhchivan exclave could cut off its access to Armenia and places further north. It is also concerned about Azerbaijan's strong and growing friendship with Tehran's biggest rival, Israel, which helped arm Baku against its offensive in Karabakh. In the new reality that emerged after the offensive, Azerbaijan does not have to worry about Iranian supplies to Karabakh, but Iranian concerns about the Zangazir corridor remain. Tehran has long called on Azerbaijan to abandon this idea and instead further develop existing routes on the territory of Iran. Prior to the recent visit of Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to Nakhchivan last month, Erdogan, along with Aliyev, was expected to revive the demand for the Zangazir corridor. Erdogan told media that if Armenia does not agree to the creation of the corridor, an alternative will be created by Iran. And now, let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. The Raisi Aliyev meeting underscored a mutual commitment to improving bilateral ties and navigating roadblocks such as Azerbaijan's strong strategic connection to Israel. The presidents traveled to the border area to inaugurate a hydropower facility on the Eras River, which forms the border between the two countries. Aliyev also outlined grand plans for the areas north of the river, aiming to transform them into a green energy zone. The May 19th meeting marked a significant moment for both nations, symbolizing a new era of bilateral cooperation. The ceremony capped months of work to finalize various projects related to power generation and connectivity aimed at resetting relations. Iran, despite viewing Azerbaijan's reconquest of Nagorno-Karabakh from 2020 to 23 as detrimental due to Baku's close ties with Israel and Turkey, has opted to pursue a closer relationship with Azerbaijan. While Raisi's death may trigger a succession struggle in Tehran with potential side effects, it is not expected to alter Iran's approach towards Baku. Azerbaijan, therefore, remains determined to preserve its strategic autonomy, Positioned as a linchpin in various trade and energy networks involving the US, the EU, China, and Russia, and Iran, Azerbaijan enjoys significant geopolitical flexibility. Now, this allows Baku to resist pressure from any single state, even occasionally bucking its closest ally, Turkey. Despite ongoing fighting in Gaza, Azerbaijan has not joined a Turkish trade embargo on Israel, with Azeri oil continuing to ship to Israel through Turkish ports. 
In this complex landscape, Iran appears willing to tolerate Azerbaijan's independent stance to achieve its goal of developing the North-South Trade Corridor. Two major developments in recent years, Azerbaijan's conquest of Nagorno-Karabakh and Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, have created new diplomatic openings for Iran. They have allowed Iran and Azerbaijan to smooth over what was a prickly relationship for much of the post-Soviet period. Other geopolitical factors are also pushing Tehran and Yerevan in divergent directions. So, while the geopolitical landscape of the Caucasus continues to shift and chum, Iran's strategy remains a delicate balancing act. Tehran's challenge is to navigate these turbulent waters without tipping the scales too far in either direction. And now, here to shed more light on the issue is Rusiv Husinov, a director of Top Shubashov Center. Hello, sir, and welcome to TVP World. Hello, thank you for having me. So can you start by helping us elaborate on this recent agreement between Iran and Azerbaijan, particularly concerning the diplomatic re-engagement and a lot of these infrastructure plans? Yes, indeed, Azerbaijan and Iran have had many ups and downs in the past three decades since the former independence. However, since the 2020 Karabakh War, the, both countries have had uh, their relations very strained, which culminated with the attack on the Azerbaijani embassy in Iran's capital back in January last year. However, both parties, realizing the need to normalize their relations, tried to, uh, tried to uh, get uh, some sort of rapprochement or re-engagement through certain infrastructure projects. One of them is the overland passage between the mainland Azerbaijan and its exclave Nakhchivan via Iranian soil, dubbed as the Aras Corridor. Another infrastructure project, which both President Aliyev and late President Raisi attended uh, like, uh, some, some days ago was the uh, hydroelectric uh, 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 complexes between Azerbaijan and Iran, namely Khudafarin and Kızgalasa. These infrastructure projects were expected to somehow normalize the uh, strained relations between the neighboring countries. Right. Can you help us understand that a little bit? Like you mentioned, there's an attack on the embassy. I would imagine that to be such a, a pretty dramatic event. So how will these infrastructure help amend the said uh, strange relationship that you were mentioning? Well, following the, the attack on the Azerbaijani embassy, the ties, the political ties between the two countries have reached probably their historical low point. In order to mend these broken relations, the Azerbaijani side has had several demands, and one of them included the punishment of the perpetrators. The Iranian side also tried to uh, mend these ties, and uh, they also offered these infrastructure projects. Uh, the, the, these initiatives um, can uh, sort of uh, uh, mend the bro broken relations by building the trust, mutual trust between the two capitals, and also uh, start several mutually uh, uh, economically uh, beneficial uh, projects. So uh, this this is why uh, both parties believed that by inaugurating or by developing some joint projects the neighboring countries could reach uh, their normalcy back. All right, like the plan is to, through economic ties, maybe mend the diplomatic ties a little bit. And so can you help us understand how these infrastructure would align with their economic strategies? Uh, Azerbaijan and Iran uh, share a long, long border. And these uh, uh, projects, uh, for, for instance, these um, hydroelectric complexes, uh, they have been developing jointly, uh, um, are, are just on the border between the two countries. In order to 
to somehow secure several water-related problems, Azerbaijan and Iran are both needing uh, these projects because the northern part of Iran uh, is in desperate need of water resources. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Azerbaijani side also needs uh, this type of water resources, especially for the liberated territories in Karabakh. And instead of instead of um, fighting over the uh, water resources, uh, the both sides wisely approached this issue and decided to jointly develop these water uh, resources. As for the another project, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Aras Corridor, the Azerbaijani side has has been struggling uh, with with uh, reaching out to its exclave Nakhchivan. Uh, in the past several years, we have had mainly two options via Armenia, the Zangazur corridor, or via Iran, which is traditional access to Nakhchivan. And in the past two years, Azerbaijan and Iran have been trying to d develop this Aras corridor in order to somehow s smooth the overland passage between uh, mainland Azerbaijan and Nakhchivan. And again, uh, both parties believed that these mega infrastructure projects could help um, mutual confidence building. Right, and like you mentioned, they have been trying to uh, reach mutual, mutual understanding and try to mend their relationship. However, there is something that throws a wrench into the mix, I believe, as uh, we do know that Azerbaijan has a security ties with Israel. That should not garner them any support when it comes to the Iranian side. So how does that factor in? There are several factors which always serve as a source of concern for both parties. Um, the Azerbaijani side has been in a very friendly relations, some people even call this strategic partnership, with Israel, which definitely irritates the political regime in Tehran. The secular nature of the Azerbaijani society, which is nominally Shia, which is nominally Shia, is also uh, not so much liked by the Iranian side, which definitely wants to export its version of Islam uh, to, to uh, us, to Iran's northern neighbor. Uh, plus, the existence of uh, millions of ethnic Azerbaijanis inside of Iran, some estimate uh, 20, even 30 million people, also uh, generates some fear in the Iranian capital about possible Azerbaijani irredentism. However, the Azerbaijani side also has its own security concerns about Iran. Iran has been supporting Azerbaijan's arch nemesis, Armenia. It also uh, has accumulated a great experience of uh, fighting proxy wars in, in some neighboring countries, even beyond. Therefore, the Shia proxy groups, some paramilitary organizations, which aim to destroy the Azerbaijani secular statehood and supported by the Iranian side is always uh, is always uh, approached by the Azerbaijani side with a serious uh, concern. The, the, in the case of Azerbaijan, uh, the relationship with Israel is of strategic importance because Azerbaijan has been modernizing its army through state-of-the-art weaponry made, uh, made in Israel, plus uh, both the state of Israel and Jewish diaspora abroad, uh, they have been very helpful uh, for the Azerbaijani cause in different Western capitals. All right, so like you break it down to us, this whole thing looks like a very convoluted web where there's allies everywhere while nemesis everywhere. With all things so tangled up, how do you think peace could be achieved realistically? While, while uh, trying to explain the geopolitical alignments uh, in our region, I also realized how confusing it, it may sound, because just imagine Azerbaijan and Iran, they are both Shia societies. However, Azerbaijan enjoys strategic partnership with a Jewish state, while Iran is supporting Azerbaijan's Christian foe, Armenia. So this is really, really complicated in our region. 
uh, as I already said, Azerbaijan and Iran uh, have have had their ups and downs in the relations. Uh, economically, the trade, the relations have been okay, but politically and geopolitically, geopolitically, uh, we always witness tensions and some sort of distrust between Baku and Tehran. However, uh, the aforementioned infrastructure project to some extent help overcome some of these fears and challenges. We'll see, we'll see how it works. Uh, unfortunately, the death of the Iranian president after the meeting uh, by Jani counterpart will, uh, will leave some sort of negative footprint on the, uh, on the relations between the two countries. All right. Like you mentioned, it is a very complicated issue, a very tangled up. So thank you so much for helping us unpack some of it and gain a little bit more understanding. Appreciate it. And thanks for being with us on Eastern Express. My pleasure. Thank you. And now we're moving on to the Eastern News Flash, a series of all the other stories from the East that you don't want to miss. The Ukrainian authorities are convinced that the ongoing war with Russia is most likely to end with negotiations. Consequently, the country is now promoting the peace formula put forward by President Volodymyr Zelensky. The Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, Alexander Litvinenko, presented Kiev's position during the 16th Baltic Sea Region Forum, NATO 2024 and the Arctic and Europe. Litvinenko remains convinced that the Ukrainian proposal will be supported by the participants of the peace summit in Switzerland in June 2024, as the summit offers a real diplomatic track that has every chance of contributing to a just peace. The official reiterated that Ukraine is not interested in a truce that would last for a couple of years, but rather stable peace for decades that would enable Ukraine's development. At the same time, he expressed hope that Ukraine will receive a formal invitation to the alliance at this year's NATO summit in Washington. The Polish government secured an agreement with the European Investment Bank worth around 300 million euros. Under the deal, Poland is to construct its part of the pan-European air defense. Polish PM Donald Tusk confirmed back in April that Poland aims to join the European Sky Shield initiative, currently consisting of 21 countries. The project's goal is to create an Iron Dome-style air defense system covering several European NATO member states. Tusk announced that he and other European prime ministers would present the project of building an Iron Dome over Europe, claiming that the idea of pan-European air defense is not a dream but a practical plan. The EIB loan will cover the development of the satellite and reconnaissance systems, essential parts of the project. According to Tusk, Poland will take advantage of these European opportunities since Europe's security depends largely on Poland's security. U.S. lawmakers have backed bills to impose sanctions on Russia's state nuclear energy cooperation, Rosatom, and individuals posing threats to the safety of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukrainian authorities have for months pushed for the introduction of further sanctions on the Russian energy sector. Form of the resolution is One of the as bills as aims to end U.S. dependence on Russian nuclear power by replacing this Russian suppliers with U.S. and allied manufacturers, watching. while limiting the Russian government's access to revenues through sanctions and export controls against Rosatom. The second bill proposes sanctions against individuals who threaten the integrity, security or undermine Ukraine's operational control over the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, including freezing of assets, revocation of visas and fines. Ukraine has insisted on sanctions against the Russian nuclear sector in connection with the violation by Russian forces and Rosatom personnel of the basic rules of nuclear and radiological safety during their military operations in Ukraine, in particular the occupation of Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia. At least three EU countries, France, Hungary and Bulgaria, have reportedly blocked sanctions against Rosatom. The International Criminal Court announced that it is seeking arrest warrants for Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as senior Hamas figures. 
on the basis of evidence collected. ICC's chief prosecutor Karim Khan said he believes Netanyahu, Israeli Defense Minister Yaov Gallant, and three Hamas leaders, Yehya Sinwar, Mohammed Dave, and Ismail Haniyeh, are responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity in the Gaza Strip and Israel. In his statement, Khan explained he has reasonable grounds to believe Netanyahu and Gallant bear criminal responsibility for alleged war crimes, including starvations of civilians as a method of warfare, willfully causing great suffering, intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population and other inhumane acts. The three Hamas leaders were accused of responsibility for extermination, taking hostages, rape and other acts of sexual violence, torture and other inhumane acts. U.S. President Joe Biden condemned the court's decision to issue arrest warrants for Israeli leaders, calling it an outrageous action. The court's three pre-trial judges will determine whether there is sufficient evidence to issue warrants. And that's all on this episode of Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World.